All right. So, hello everyone. Salam namaste aga. Good morning here in America and good morning elsewhere in the global audience. And welcome to in Indian Diaspora's today's event. We have today's topic is Muslim women and personal law in India today. And the speaker is a very well known expert on the subject, Professor Sylvia Vettu, Professor Emerita of Anthropology anthropology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And her interest is king, kingship and social organization with a regional specialization in South Asian Muslim personal law and, it in, and its impact on women. And as you can see that she, she has written a very good book, Marriage and its Discontent, uh, that is part of the poster. She will be formally introduced by Dr. Asya Alam, who is the associate professor uh, at Louisiana State University, Baton Rouge. And the concluding remark will be given by Professor Huma Ahmed Ghosh, who is a distinguished professor at the Department of Women's Studies at San Diego. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, and all three speakers here have the common interest in women, uh, South Asian women, in particular Muslim women's uh, and gender studies. So welcome you all, and now I invite Dr. Asya Alam for a formal uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Razisa, for inviting me uh, to this event and for asking me to introduce uh, Dr. Sylvia Vatuk. Um, so it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Sylvia Vatuk, who is a professor emerita at University of Illinois, Chicago. I have known Dr. Vatuk for more than a decade now. Um, I first met her when I came to the US and completed my bachelorette at University of Illinois at Chicago in 2003. I entered the graduate program with a broad interest in lives and histories of Muslim women. And that is when uh, Dr. Vatuk's work became intimately connected with my academic and professional endeavors. One of the first sources from my research that I started reading were women's autobiographies. And there were two autobiographies that made an impression on me. One was Saida Bano Ahmed's Dagar Se Hatkar, and which I found striking in the details that it presented of family life. And the second was Saleh Abid Hussain's Silsila Eros O Shab, which had rich literary and personal reflections. Uh, both of them led me to the question, what is the debate on marriage among Urdu speaking Muslims in the colonial period? When you do women's history, you understand very clearly that issues aren't isolated from each other, that everything is interconnected, and that questions of marriage and family, for example, are related obviously to legislation, which Dr. Watuk will talk about today, and to court cases, but also to other issues such as their education, even to literary concepts such as self-narration, including genres of autobiography, down to the most ordinary details of their everyday lives. It is this framework that encapsulates Dr. Watuk's academic career. She completed her doctorate from Harvard in 1970, and her first book was published in 1972, which was called Kinship and Urbanization, White Collar Migrants in North India. Set in Merit in UP, the study looked at the impact of urbanization on the family and kinship system and the significance of the urban neighborhood in a changing uh, society. In later years, and especially in the years that I have known Dr. Watuk, um, her research has, uh, has expanded to include history of Muslim women's writings, especially novels and autobiographies, while keeping her earlier interest in kinship and family. And here I think she hones her skills also as a historian in addition to being an anthropologist. Among her analysis of women's writing uh, was Zakira Ghaz's Hamara Doro Hayat. Uh, Zakira Begum was born in 1921 in Hyderabad and died in 2003 in Chennai. In analyzing her narrative, Dr. Vatuk writes, there is some evidence in the text and more in Zakira's commentary on it that girls and women had agendas for their current lives, for their futures and the futures of their daughters that were somewhat ahead of those of their mildly reformist fathers and husbands, unquote. Dr. Watu has continued this interest in Muslim women's autobiographies in her most recent research as well. And she has shared uh, one of the things that she has now sent for publication 
um, which is where she has analyzed sections of Kitab-e Zindagi, which was authored by Kesari Begum, who was born in Delhi in 1888 and died in Hyderabad in 1977. So Dr. Vatuk focuses on accounts of illnesses and deaths of several members of Kesri Begum's immediate family. And she also compares Kesri Begum's account to her earlier analysis of Zakira Ghazi's account that she had worked on. Um, so Dr. Vatuk's continued interest in Muslim women's lives is also illustrated by the publication of her second book, Marriage and Its Discontents, Women, Islam, and the Law in India. The central thrust of the book uh, focuses on issues of divorce among Muslims by looking at a variety of sources, including court petitions, matrimonial dis uh, disputes in state documents, like the All Women Police Station in Chennai and Hyderabad, and interviews with divorced and separated Muslim women, advocates, legal aid staff, judges, court personnel, and Islamic clerics. In addition to these issues, she also looks at ways in which the marriage is contracted and the considerations involved in selecting a spouse. Um, so this is a broad sort of introduction of her work uh, when it comes to women's writings, when it comes to women's issues. Um, and uh, I would like to sort of uh, say a few uh, lines from Dr. Vatoks. I would like to quote her own words on how she became interested in what the topic that she's going to speak uh, up on today. And I think that would be a good segue into her own presentation. She says, uh, I became interested in questions of Muslim personal law with regards to its consequences for the well-being of Indian Muslim women after more than a decade off and on of conducting a ethnographic and historical research and writing on issues of gender, family, and kinship among South Indian Muslims. I was inspired to turn my attention to this topic due to an increasing unease with the prevailing tendency of the popular journalistic and even much of the scholarly literature to account for most of the social disabilities under which Muslim women suffer by reference to the personal law regime by which they are governed. I often encountered the same rhetoric when discussing my research with Indian colleagues and others of my acquaintance who almost invariably wanted to begin the conversation by deploring the fate of Muslim women suffering under laws peculiar to their religion. I naturally recognized and by no means wish to minimize the significance of the severe gender bias that is entailed in these provisions of Islamic law or the damage they inflict on many Islam. Muslim women, yet in several years of ethnographic and archival research among Muslims in Chennai and Hyderabad, I had found that I had not found that issues of this kind dominated the everyday concerns. I therefore felt a need to examine the empirical basis for these stereotypes about Muslim women suffering under the oppressive burden of personal law and thereby perhaps find a way of undermining some of the uh, rhetoric. So as she says that it, you know, she uh, sort of, it shows her interest in these issues without in any way undermining the question of gender bias, but also giving full agency to what she had found uh, Muslim women in her ethnographic and historical research. So I now turn over the, you know, this platform to Dr. Sylvia Vatuk, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Asia, for a very nice uh, introduction, and uh, I would like to, I would like to read it actually, <laughs> so I can re read it in in times when I'm feeling wondering <laughs> if it's all been worth it or not. Um, <clears throat> this talk, uh, I was asked. The topic was actually suggested um, by uh, Mr. Razieddin. Uh, and uh, so I'll be talking about women, Islam, and divorce in women, Islam, and the law in India, the issue of divorce. Um, it is based on research that I've been doing in India for about 20 years on different aspects of Muslim family law as it is administered in India with a focus on its implications for women's well-being. Um, this research has been both ethnographic and archival. 
I've observed family and criminal courts in Chennai and Hyderabad, examining the court files and interviewing the judges, magistrates, court counselors, lawyers, police, staff of NGOs, and the litigants, as well as others with experience dealing with family issues in the courts. And I've also observed proceedings in in several Sharia courts in both cities, um, examining court files and interviewing the Qazis who preside over them and also their assistants and the men, some of the men and women who come to them for help. Um, in recent years, anti-Muslim sentiment, government policies and vigilante violence against Muslims have seen an alarming rise in India especially after the 2014 election of Narendra Modi and the ascendance of the BJP. But this is, of course, something of which you all are well aware, and I'm not going to uh, give any more attention to it. But that provides some of the background of the heightened attention that has recently been increasing um, about issues of Muslim personal law. <clears throat> By way of background, the total population of India is now estimated to be approximately 1,442,000. This is an estimate because there has not, not been a census since 2011 for some unexplained reasons the government has not gone through with a census in 2021, which it would be normally have been scheduled. Um, we're dealing here with a multi-religious country. Hindus constitute a, almost 80% of the population, Muslims a little more than 14, Christians about 2.3, and Jews, Parsis, and others uh, approximately 4%. The Muslim population is estimated now to be about 200 million. It is the largest Muslim population of any country in the world except Indonesia, approximately 75% Sunni, 20 to 25% Shia, and a few other small sects. The legal system is is a common law system based mainly on the British model. All criminal laws and most civil laws apply to every resident, regardless of religion. But in the realm of family law, called personal law in India, each religious community has a separate distinctive legal code covering marriage, divorce, inheritance, child custody, and so on. Uh, it apply, applies to adher all adherents of that religion, that is anyone born into or converted to that religion or married in a ceremony of that religion. This system was originally put into effect in the 18th century uh, by the British. Um, the East India Company began operating in India in the early 17th century gradually gained control over territory, first through agreements with local rulers and then through military force. By the late 18th century, it had solidified its control over a large region around modern day Calcutta and began setting up a body of laws and a judicial system to administer them, to administer them in order to keep order, regulate business and other transactions and so on. Under the previous Muslim rulers, family disputes among Muslims were adjudicated by Qazis in Sharia courts. Others were allowed to resolve domestic and marital disputes according to their own laws and customs. But the British encountered difficulties around imposing British laws of marriage and divorce and so on on the local populace whose traditional customs were very different from their own. They were worried about the consequences of doing this. It might arouse hostility and even possibly foment rebellion 
among the indigenous population, which of course vastly over outnumbered them. So they developed a system whereby Indians would be governed by their own religiously derived family laws, but would be that would be administered by British judges in British style courts. The Hindus and Muslims would each be governed by the rules laid down in their respective sacred books. For Hindus, the Shastras, for Muslims, the Quran. Personal law codes, law codes for all religions except Islam and Judaism are today laid out in statutes that were enacted by the British colonial government in the 19th and early 20th century, and then by India's parliament after independence. Christian personal laws based closely on the laws then, then current in Great Britain were the Indian, are the Indian Divorce Act 1869 and the Christian Marriage Act of 1872. Parsis are governed by laws drafted by leaders of the Parsi community itself. Uh, the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act, 1936. Hindus were previously governed by uncodified Hindu religious law, but now by the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 and the Hindu Succession Act, 1956. Finally, for persons of different religions or for couples of the same religion who prefer to marry in a secular rather than in a religious ceremony, there is the Special Act, Special Marriage Act of 1869, which was later amended in 1954. It can also be used by couples who are already married under their own religious personal law code but who wish to evade some of that code's provisions. They can register their marriage after the fact under the Special Marriage Act in order to be governed henceforth by its provisions instead. People do this usually for reasons of inheritance or child custody, sometimes even for reasons of divorce. After independence, many of the nation's new leaders wished to replace the existing system of religion-specific personal laws with a national code that would apply to all citizens, regardless of religion. This is called the Uniform Civil Code, or the UCC, abbreviated. But, too, but there was too much opposition from leaders of all religions so this proposal had to be put on a back burner and is so mentioned in the constitution. Still a burning political, it is still a burning political issue. There is much discussion about it in the media, but nothing concrete is underway to make it actually happen. India has no special religious courts. Cases under the personal laws are heard either in the regular civil courts or in big cities in specialized family courts. Judges are appointed by the state without regard for their own personal religious affiliation. Their own religion is similarly not taken into account when cases are being assigned to them. The vast majority of Hindus are Hindu. This is excuse me, the vast majority of judges are Hindu. This is to be expected given their predominance in the population, while most of the remaining judges are either Christian or Parsi. Although Muslims constitute over 14% of the population, there are very few Muslim judges at any level of the judiciary. Partly this is due, due to prejudice discrimination against them, but also because of the community's poverty, low levels of educational achievement, and lack of the personal connections, the networking that enables one to get appointed in the first place. Indi <clears throat> Indian 
Muslim personal law derives mainly from the Hanafi school, modified by over two centuries of judicial decisions by British colonial courts and post-independence high courts and the, and the Supreme Court of India. It is mostly uncodified. There are only five statutes. Three of them were enacted before independence. The Waqf Validating Act of 1913, which was passed in order to allow family endowments. The Sharia Act 1937, which specifies that in all cases involving Muslims, Islamic law will supersede Muslim customary laws, which were being used uh, all over the country, but especially in the Northwest of India at that time. And thirdly, the Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act 1939. Under this, this act allows a woman to sue her husband for divorce on a number of fault grounds, and I'll mention those later. There are also two statutes that were passed after independence. The Muslim, woman, the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act of 1983 uh, deals with the issue of maintenance for divorced Muslim women. And the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Act of 2019 makes triple talaq, again, I'll discuss that later, makes triple talaq a criminal offense. All of those acts, except the last one, were originally drafted by Muslim religious leaders and then were you know, passed on to government uh, agencies and so on and have been revised. Uh, but, but the impetus for them uh, comes from Muslim community leaders themselves. The, the, the lack of, of gender equity in Muslim personal law has long been the main focus of criticism by the public and the media uh, the criticism of Muslim personal law. And this is also the principal argument put forward by proponents of a, of a uniform civil code. <clears throat> in, in Muslim personal law, this gender bias is found in, these, in several different uh, areas. First of all, a Muslim man can divorce his wife instant, well, not necessarily instantaneously, but can divorce her by uttering the word talaq three times. Men of other religions have to file suit for divorce in a court of law. Secondly, a Muslim man can marry up to four women at one time or be married to up to four women at one time. For people of other religions, bigamy is a crime. Thirdly, if a divorced Muslim couple wishes to remarry each other, the woman must first marry another man, consummate that marriage, and then be divorced by that husband. Only after that can she marry the man that she was divorced from. This custom, this practice is called halala. In other religions, any divorced couple is free to remarry whenever they wish. Fourthly, a Muslim woman inherits only half of what a man in the same relationship would inherit when their parent dies. So for example, a daughter gets half of what a son gets when their parent dies, a wife gets from her husband's estate only half of what a man gets from his wife's estate, and so on. And there are other more detailed uh, provisions in Islamic law that similarly disadvantage women as against men. Clearly, I won't have time to discuss all four of these points, 
So I will just focus on the issue of divorce, something that has been very much in the news of late. As most of you probably already know, a divorce is very easy for men, for Muslim men, but difficult and often impossible for women. A man can divorce his wife extrajudicially, unilaterally, and with immediate effect by simply pronouncing talaq three times, either orally or in writing, and nowadays increasingly by email, text, even by Instagram, on FaceTime, or on Zoom. In Islamic law, the most approved way of divorcing one's wife is to pronounce the three talaqs one at a time with a one month gap between each utterance, giving the man opportunities to change his mind before the divorce becomes final or for the couple to, you know, to reunite, to reconcile. Um, this is called the uh, talaq al sunnah. This is the, the uh, Arabic word for that type of approved divorce. However, in India, the most frequently employed method is the di disapproved, so-called innovative method, talaq al bidat in which the man utters the three talaqs all at once in quick succession. The divorce then becomes immediately final and irrevocable. This is the so-called triple talaq. In India, although some ulama question the legitimacy of divorces affected in this way, most of them, whether they approve of it or not, regarded as valid under Islamic law. One serious consequence of this triple talaq is that even if the man has uttered the words in anger or under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and even if he immediately tries to retract it or later changes his mind, the marriage has been irrevocably dissolved and the couple cannot marry one another unless the woman goes through the halala procedure. Up until now, courts have usually accepted the legitimacy of any talaq divorce in which the gradual Islamically approved procedures were followed. Triple talaqs have also long been recognized by the court. Those, but several recently but several recent high and Supreme Court decisions, which I will discuss later, have dissented on this point. Now, as far as divorce initiated by the wife is concerned, she has three options. First, she can offer her husband a material compensation for agreeing to divorce her. This kind of divorce is called kula. Second, she can persuade or she can try to persuade a religious authority that she has valid religious reasons for wanting her marriage annulled. This is called fusk or fuxinika. Thirdly, she can sue for divorce in a regular civil or family court under the law that I mentioned above, the Dis Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act of 1939. Kula is in fact the most frequent form of divorce sought by Muslim women in India today, and the most frequent kind of divorce that Muslim women actually get um, at their initiative, not you know, not as many as the lot, but of those that women have initiated. In this, the wife asks the husband to divorce her and offers financial compensation for releasing her from the marriage. If he accepts, he pronounces talaq and the marriage is dissolved. She can then marry again someone else 
after one menstrual cycle has passed. But according to most religious authorities in India, there is no divorce with, of this kind without the man's consent. The most usual form of compensation is for the wife to waive her right to the man, the legally required gift of money or valuables that is supposed to be given by the groom to the bride at the time of the wedding, but in India is almost always deferred to some indefinite future date. The amount is agreed upon by both families for the wedding and is written, written into the marriage contract. But as I and others scholars have found, it is very rarely paid. So that means that when the question of a divorce arises in her mind, she usually has not gotten it yet. So all she does is waive her right to get it. And the result is that no actual money or other valuables do change hands. The call can be finalized by a private oral or written agreement between the two parties. However, more often the wife or her male family members will consult a Qazi or an Imam or the governing board, the Jamaat of the couple's local mosque, mosque for guidance in order to negotiate with the husband with whom she's usually not no longer living and help with, in writing up a suitable agreement. Some women will cons consult a lawyer for this purpose. The second option is to try to get the fusk and nikah. If the husband refuses to accept his wife offer for kula, or if she's unable to locate him, which is often the case, this is her second option. It is not technically a divorce, but is rather an annulment of the marriage. In classical Hanafi law, fusk could be granted on very limited grounds, most of them related to some irregularity or impropriety in the marriage itself. For example, that the relationship between the pair was in incestuous, or that the husband was impotent at the time of marriage, or that he had disappeared so long ago that by the time the wife complained, he would be already 90 years of age. Not all Qazis today will grant an application or even consider it uh, an application for fusk. And even those who do so will not do so easily. While they are perhaps not no longer bound by these very restrictive Hanafi grounds, they do examine the woman and her witnesses at length and carry out intensive, invasive investigations of her history, her reputation, and her marital situation in order to ensure to their own satisfaction that her desire to end the marriage is religiously justified. Thirdly, the third option is to go to court and file suit under the Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act. She can do so in her local district court. Unt until this was passed in 1939, desperate women who couldn't get kula were reportedly getting around the very restrictive Hanafi laws by resorting to apostasy, by renouncing Islam and converting usually to Christianity. At that time, to do so was held to automatically end her Muslim marriage. At that time, this was already in the early 1930s, some prominent ulama fearing that this practice indicated a growing trend of women leaving the faith, 
drafted a bill to give them a more religiously acceptable way of, of divorcing an abusive, neglectful, or absent husband, while also ensuring that the act of apostasy would no longer be a way of putting an end to the marriage. The colonial government approved the bill and in 1939, it was passed by the Legislative Assembly. It specifies nine grounds under which a woman can be awarded a divorce. Desertion, failure to maintain, excessive cruelty, imprisonment, imprisonment for an extended period, incurable disease, and so on. However, research has shown that this act is very little used. There are a number of reasons for this. First of all, Muslims in general, and women in particular, are unaware of the law's existence. I did find in interviewing one of the Qazis in, in uh, Chennai that he sometimes, if he, would, if he could not give fusk and if kula was also not possible, he would direct women to this saying, you can go to court. But otherwise, probably those women had never heard of such a thing before and Anyway, even if they tried, the cost of filing a suit in, in the court, court fees, the lawyers, because you really need a lawyer, bribes to staff of the court, and so on. Then it takes a very long time to resolve these cases. Sometimes they can drag on for months or even longer if the husband, you know, fights it. Um, also, women feel uncomfortable and are looked down upon when they venture into all male spa spaces like the court. If they do go, they require a male chaperone because of, of parda practices. Uh, and finally, there is a general a feeling that private family affairs should not be aired in front of strangers. So all of these things militate against women uh, applying uh, for this uh, kind of relief. Um, my research in the family courts in, in, um, for, in, in Chennai and Hyderabad I examined several years worth of records on divorce among Muslims under the Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act. And I found that most suits were dropped or dismissed well before a judgment was issued. There are a number of reasons for this also. <laughs> Once this suit is filed before it comes before the judge, the couple have to endure obligatory sessions of marriage counseling. This is a requirement under the Family Courts Act. And in these counseling sessions, as I observed, the wife is almost always encouraged to make the best of her situation, try harder to please her husband, to be more obedient to his wishes, and to conform to any restrictions he may be placing on her movements outside of the home. Second reason is that very often the husband fails time and again to appear when called by the judge. And even when he does appear, he refuses to cooperate with the court counselor, denies all of his wife's allegations, and often then files a return suit for restitution of conjugal rights. This is a law under which a man of any religion can ask the court to order a wife who has left him to return to the marital home. In most cases, as expected, she fails to comply with the order. But typically, he doesn't want her to come back anyway 
but has used the law mainly as a way of harassing and punishing his absconding wife. Thirdly, these tactics stretch out the time to the point where the woman often gives up the whole thing, figuring that she has no chance of success. So that means that only a small proportion of the women who file for divorce pursue it to judgment. Other times the case is dropped because the couple has reconciled, they have made an out of court settlement, or have divorced extrajudicially by talaq or by kula. However, if a woman is really determined to get a divorce, if she has enough money to afford a good lawyer and pay the various court fees and bribes and has evidence, solid evidence to prove her claims against her husband, she usually succeeds. There's a widespread rhetoric in India, in the media and among the general public, even among academics, that the Muslim divorce rate is very high and far greater than that of Hindus. But there is little evidence to support this notion. In order to verify whether it's true or not, one would unfortunately need to know what the actual divorce rate is among Muslims, but this is impossible to calculate since most divorces take place extrajudici extrajudicially and there are no government records on these numbers. It is well known that Indian divorce rates overall are extremely low and in fact, just about the lowest in the whole world Census figures are sometimes used to estimate the Muslim divorce rate. Because in the census, they ask you your marital status. And so looking at, and, and when you can find uh, tables, you know, that, that break it down by religion and gender, you find that there is a slightly higher percentage of Muslim than Hindu women who say in answer to the question that they are divorced. But, and this, but this percentage is way lower even than in Muslim majority countries in the Middle East or South Asia, never mind in comparison to other societies of the world. Um, one of the figures that, um, one of the websites that, that had these figures broken down showed that uh, whereas uh, the Muslim percentage of Muslim women who said they were either divorced or separated was <clears throat> just under 0.5 percent and under and for Hindus it was about 0.25 percent so but there are a lot of problems with with these uh, figures and to the, how they really show a big difference between Muslims and Hindu women is not at all clear one must also in comparing them, take account of the fact that in India, it is far harder for a Hindu than for a Muslim to get divorced in the first place. So naturally you would expect that the number of Hindu women divorced has got to be lower in any case than the Muslim. Census figures on women of all religions also always show a higher number of separated women than divorced women. And this is also true of Muslim women as well. A man who is unhappy in his marriage doesn't necessarily bother to divorce his wife. He simply, he can simply throw her out of the home, move out himself without leaving a forwarding address, or 
in order to show somewhat more consideration for her, he simply takes her ostensibly for a visit to her parents' home and then never comes back to retrieve her. Or he may simply make life so miserable for her that she leaves of her own accord. Since he is free to marry another woman without divorcing the first, he has no particular motivation to take, this, to take that step. But sometimes he fails to divorce her intentionally. What would be the reasons for this? First of all, he's legally obligated upon divorce to pay his wife the meher, the marriage gift that he was was uh, that he had to pay in order to uh, to uh, marry her. There is no mechanism actually to enforce this payment, but men are often subject to strong pressure from her relatives and from others in the community to come up with this money. Secondly, the idea of divorce is actually widely disapproved in the Muslim community. It is, it is the thing that in the Quran is said to be most disliked by Allah and should only be considered if it is absolutely impossible for a couple to continue living together, quote, while remaining within God's limits, that is, without committing adultery. Therefore, the man's reputation will suffer if he divorces a woman about whom he cannot uh, claim even has, has uh, behaved in any bad way. So it is better for him just to make it known that she has left for her parents' home and has denied his repeated pleas to return. Thirdly, a respectable woman will only marry a man if her parents approve, or even better, if they have arranged the marriage for her. So a man who hopes to contract a second marriage may find it difficult once the prospective bride's family learns that he has divorced his previous wife. So how can he easily negotiate a suitable match? Finally, he sometimes deliberately avoids pronouncing divorce in order to punish his wife for leaving him or for some other past transgressions. Knowing that she cannot marry another man unless he releases her from the marriage, he prefers to leave her hanging, as the expression goes, married in name only, tied to him forever, but with none of the advantages of being an actual wife. The practice of so-called triple talaq has long been criticized by various elements of the non-Muslim population in India, as well as by leaders of certain minority Sunni sects and by the Shia more generally. However, it is in India a very common way of divorcing a wife. Outlawing talaq and pressing for a uniform civil code was for decades very high on the pr priority list of the Indian feminist movement. But in, in the mid 1980s, attacks on Muslim law which taken up by right-wing Hindu political leaders as a central demand of their platform, which caused many feminists to begin to retreat from this position. And this of course uh, was even more, happened even more so after uh, 2014. Although the feminist movement's membership is largely Hindu, they are generally left-leaning and very averse to allying themselves with parties like the BJP. Now most feminist groups have ceased calling, calling out for a, UC, for a uniform civil code 
and instead are advocating that each religious code be revised internally by those to whom it applies. The goal being to eventually achieve universal gender equity while preserving the separateness of each religious community's personal laws. Beginning in the late 1980s, Muslim women's activist NGOs began to organize themselves around issues of women's rights in Islam. These ideas were first discussed in small groups in different cities unconnected with one another. But some of them had begun to communicate, holding periodic networking meetings on an annual basis. I began some research on this movement in 2005 and went back again in 2011, visiting the headquarters of several of them in different cities around India, Delhi, Calcutta, Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, and Hyderabad interviewing their leaders, sitting in on some of their gatherings to observe the proceedings and listen in on their discussions. I published some of my findings in journal articles in 2008 and again in 2013, but a lot more has been published about these organizations more recently by other scholars. The women in this movement do not reject Islam. They all insist on the genuineness of its sacred book, the Quran, as God's word, and of the Hadith, the traditions of the prophet and his life. Some are more devout than others, but none of them outwardly reject the religion or, or say that they no longer believe in it. <clears throat> the problem, they say, is that the Quran for hundreds of years has been wrongly interpreted by conservative male religious authorities, the ulama. Blinded by patriarchal self-interest, they say, these men have been for centuries misleading their illiterate followers as to the true meaning of the Quran, making people believe that women are inferior to men that they must be controlled by men and, and be denied access to the same rights of free movement and participation in public life that the men enjoy. These, these women say that if other women read the Quran for themselves, as they say they have done, these women will see that it is actually a much more women-friendly text than they have previously been led to believe. Most of the organizations within this so-called Islamic feminist movement are relatively small and localized, but one of the newest, the Bharatiya Muslim Mahila Andolan, or the Indian Muslim Women's Movement, abbreviated as the BMMA, it is a large scale membership organization with thousands of members all over the country. It has taken a leading role in speaking out against triple talaq and certain other discriminatory provisions of Muslim personal law, as well as helping individual women fight their cases in the court. The male-led religious organizations, the largest and most influential of which is the All India Muslim Personal Law Board. It, is, it was formed in 1973 by a group of, a fairly large group of Muslim uh, scholars who, of different sects within Islam, who gathered together to protect Islamic law in India. That was their, their you know, what they, they said was their purpose. Now, this organization has gone on record as, quote, discouraging the use of triple talaq. But at the same time, it has 
fought attempts to delegalize it. This organization and others deride the pronouncements of the Islamic feminists, saying that women are not qualified to talk about the Quran or about Islamic law, about which they have had no training. However, they are forced to respond to this, these women's pronouncements because they have gotten so much attention in the media and from some political figures as well. <clears throat> the validity of triple talaq, though not, we have to note, that not of talaq as such, has been challenged in several high court appeals in recent decades. Uh, for example, a 1982 high court decision invalidated the divorce of one such uh, African, taking the position that, quote, Islam discourages divorce in principle and permits it only when it has become altogether impossible for the parties to live together in peace and harmony. It avoids, therefore, a greater evil by choosing the lesser one. Divorce is permissible in Islam only in cases of extreme emergency. In another precedent-setting 2002 case, the Supreme Court observed that, quote, the correct law of talaq as ordained by the Holy Quran is that it must be for a reasonable cause and be preceded by attempts at re reconciliation between the husband and the wife by two arbiters, one from the wife's family and the other from the, fam from the husband's family. And only if those attempts fail will the divorce take effect. So in other words, the courts have validated talaq divorce, but the question of triple talaq came up more recently. This was the case of Shayara Banu versus Union of India in August of 2017. The five member bench of the Supreme Court responded to a set of five conjoined writ petitions from women who had themselves been divorced by triple talaq and wished to challenge the legal legality of that form of divorce on the basis that it violated their rights under articles 14, 15, 21, and 25 of the Indian constitution, all of which have to do with, with rights uh, of equity of rights to everyone. I go through that, those particular articles. Um, a number of individuals and women's groups, including the BMMA, submitted affidavits in support of these petitioners. However, the All India Muslim Personal Law Board, in a 68 page counter affidavit, raised strong objections, arguing that these cases were, quote, misconceived and based on misinterpretation of the law. The court then, in a split three to two decision, declined to declare triple talaq unconstitutional. However, it issued a six month injection, injunction <laughs> on the practice and directed parliament to enact appropriate legislation on the matter. Note that the question, note again that the question was not whether a man can legally divorce his wife by talaq, but whether he can do so instantaneously by triple talaq. Following this decision, a bill was submitted by the government's Minister of Law and Justice to the Lok Sabha, the lower house of parliament, and was quickly passed, but it lingered without coming to a vote in the upper house, the Raj Sabha, until July of 2019, when it was finally passed and signed by the president of India. This act provides 
that triple talaq is illegal and a divorce pronounced in that way is also invalid. To pronounce a triple talaq is a cognizable offense. That is, it is an offense that police, in which police may arrest the man on complaint of a wife or someone to whom she is related by blood or marriage. The sentence for pronouncing triple talaq is three years in prison. There are also other provisions concerning the requirement to continue supporting the wife and so on. And it was made retroactive to September of 2018. So the BMMA helped Shira Bano and others with the RIP petition and welcomed the outcome as well as welcoming the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Act. The decision and the subsequent law was also hailed by many other Muslim women's groups, as well as by the government, the Hindu parties, and much of the media. Prime Minister Modi hailed the decision, declaring it, quote, a major step toward protecting Muslim women. But the law has also come under criticism by some feminists and feminist legal scholars. Some say this is just a way of further attacking Muslim men who are being attacked anyway in other ways in the current climate. They say it is just a repetition of the familiar trope of we are saving Muslim women from Muslim men. Others ask, what is the point of putting a man in prison? How will the wife support herself under those conditions? The act says he must support her, but if he's in prison, he won't be earning. So how is he going to support her? For this and for other reasons, most women, they say, who are divorced in this way, will simply not report it to the police. They will just accept their fate. So are women, are women charging their husbands with having, having issued triple to off? Will the act actually reduce the frequency of triple to off? It seems doubtful, but there is no real data on the question that one can use to say one way or the other. How many cases have already been filed under the act? There's no way of knowing. No appeals court have reported decisions yet on this case, or if there have been any, they are not yet accessible. Cases would of course arise in the lower courts first, but lower court cases are rarely reported. And in any case, if a decision goes against a man in the lower court, it would take quite some time for the case to be appealed or to be accepted by the appeals court and then taken up and a decision reached in the appeals court. When one looks at crime statistics, there, there is, you know, Every year, you can, you can look up all the crimes, different categories of crimes that were, um, that were, you know, that were uh, judged in the courts uh, during that period. Uh, but the official crime, these official crime statistics only available online up to 2014, which was well before this law was passed. I have tried to find cases decided under the act by looking at, at the online, leg, uh, online legal database, uh, indiancanoon.org, but I had no success. This act is, that is the, uh, one of the Marriage Protection of Rights on Marriage Act is occasionally cited in cases, in other cases that were brought 
since its enactment, but in no instance did I find one in which it was actually one of the issues that the court dealt with in its decision. In, in almost all of those cases, the appellant was a man whose wife had been awarded a maintenance of decree by a lower court under the under section 125 of the code of criminal procedure. This is a law that is applicable to, to anyone uh, and has nothing, it's not part of personal law. And it was originally put into uh, the, um, you know, the, as, as a criminal law, it was originally put in um, in order to provide for maintenance of, of women who had no, you know, uh, in, indigent, indigent women of any religion. Mostly the idea was that people were not supporting their elderly parents and especially their elderly uh, mothers. And so that's why they put this into effect. But then it was uh, later uh, amended to cover other, other relatives, including wives who would be, you know, had no means of support after divorce or while, in, while married or divorced. <laughs> So this was the thing that came up. Everyone has heard of the Shabano case, I'm sure. Uh, so it was this law of the section, this section of the Code of Criminal Procedure that was being uh, litigated in, in that uh, time of the um, uh, Shabano case for Muslim women divorce. Uh, in any case, this is what the only mention that I found of the uh, law on protection of rights on marriage was in those cases as, as laws cited, but in no case where the, was the uh, court considering that. And, it, and usually what had happened was that when the woman applied for maintenance, she, she also filed under this uh, law, triple talaq law, but it was the maintenance case that the court took up, not the other one. I wasn't able to find a single case in which, and I go in fact several years in this, you know, this database takes you right up to, uh, 2024, uh, and so I just kept going down and down, <laughs> and not, none of them, uh, there was no such case that was actually heard, at least in this database, which is a you know pretty good one. There are also a few others, but anyway. So the bottom line is that it is a very complicated issue. It is still too early if we will ever know, it is definitely too early yet to know what will happen with this uh, matter. And uh, one can only speculate. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor. It was quite informative as well as, as quite depressing also from the women point of view. Um, and let's have the concluding remark from Professor Kumar Ghosh, and then thereafter we will have the question answer. So, thank you. Ji, uh, Yes, hello. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this very enlightening session and to Asia for the introduction, and of course to Professor Sylvia Watuk, who I have known to age myself here for over 60 years. So it's not so much about her age as mine. Um, the whole talk was very informative, very detailed, and covered the history through her ethnographic, legal, and scholarly research. 
And uh, I mean, in one sentence, what uh, it concludes is how complex the whole issue of uh, a Muslim personal law is. And I really appreciate all the details and also want to point out that at some level, and uh, Sylvia, I should say Professor Vachuk or Professor Sylvia may disagree, or I may be misrepresenting, but the research is quite focused on a particular social class also. And I think that makes it uh, quite critical to this discussion uh, that is going on today with the Uniform Civil Code, because the lack of access to religious information, to general civic laws information among social classes is very high. And therefore, so-called, from my perspective, manipulation of women, women, Muslim women's rights, etc., can uh, be engaged in by those who have vested interests. I do want to, I mean, I will leave a lot of time for uh, a question and answer session, but there was one comment uh, in the chat on the Uniform Civil Code. And since uh, Professor Silver did such a good job explaining everything, I don't want to repeat any of it, but I want to take advantage of my position to conclude the discussion. We're talking about the Uniform Civil Code, which has just been passed in Uttarakhand. Yeah. And so it's not going to be a mystery anymore. It's not going to be a very complex um, legal wrangling anymore because the spaces that would have created those kinds of discussions are being shut down very systematically and systemically by the BJP in India. And, you know, the BJP, I'm sorry if I sound uh, that I'm shifting off track, but I'm not really, I'm just wanting to put it out there, that they had, they definitely had a very Hindutva, and I make a difference between Hinduism and Hindutva, and that's for a later discussion. Uh, they had a three-point agenda, which was the annexation of Jammu and Kashmir and, and the whole Ram Mandir issue. And then, of course, implementing or enforcing, as I would like to say, the Uniform Civil Code because of their more, mainly because of their uh, anti or anti-Muslim uh, sentiment rather than equal rights for women, but it does throw the whole uh, issue of the Uniform Civil Code into a very problematic space because if uh, one has to use a feminist or a human rights or a women's rights framework uh, to understand women's issues, women's rights about equality, egalitarianism, then the Uniform Civil Code at face value does sound like a good thing. Uh, what does one do if an extreme right-wing government uses it to politicize their own agenda? And I think that poses for me the biggest question because I would like to see reform in all personal laws. Uh, and I also am very concerned about why is it that family laws and personal laws become such a big issue uh, in nations and countries and situations where the same government makes changes in other kinds of laws, like the criminal law, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, it is an issue more of gender and human rights. And to me, it is about patriarchy. I know a lot of you will flinch when I use that word, but it's well and alive, so be ready for it. Uh, patriarchy always wants to control family laws because it's about women, women's lives, their status, their sexuality. It is about power. And if I use that kind of framework, then I am inclined towards accepting the UCC, even though it's under such draconian politics that I abhor. But it puts me in a situation where I feel uncomfortable uh, supporting the Muslim personal law, which is not based on gender equality. And I think that's the space that Islamic feminists, which 
is a legitimate uh, group of thinkers is trying to step into, has made changes. We've seen that with groups in Indonesia, Morocco, et cetera, is how do we really visualize women's rights within so-called Islamic law? For me, the first issue is that marriage for Muslims, it's really a legal uh, document. It is not really religious. There are suggestions in the three Islamic texts, and of course it's solidified and codified in the Sharia, how it should be and what it should be. But if I think of it as something that can be administered by a Qazi, then why is religion or the whole state of Islam as a religion so embedded in the discussion on family laws? Why cannot we separate it from the, it's thought about throwing the baby out with the bath water. We need to be aware of how times have changed hundreds of years ago. Things were very different for women and men, and today they're very different. So if we are willing to put our money in the bank and get interest on it, why are we so hesitant to work with the family law? And many other examples. So those are some of the issues in the larger framework that uh, I would like to speak to. Also, women in according to Sharia and in the various texts, they are seen as wards, they need protection, they need guardians. It's about maintenance, it's about obedience. Those are very archaic terms. Those are terms we need to, within the Muslim community, question and come up with alternatives within the system that can talk towards women's rights and equality. So my concern with the current Uniform Civil Code that has passed in uh, Uttarakhand and is now being debated in Gujarat and Assam and very soon will be in many other states is that the politicization A is problematic. The Politicization is very apparent as being anti-Muslim because the tribal groups are not part of this. They have made exceptions for tribal groups and tribal laws. So yes, have uniform civil code, but it should be for everybody. The second is that there is some kind of constitutional provision, as all of you know, and I don't want to name all the acts and articles, where there is provision for diversity, for minorities, uh, etc., And also when it comes to the Uniform Civil Code, which is men mentioned in the constitution, it has talked about it in terms of being a national agenda and not something that should be implemented state by state. So even technically there are problems with the way it's going. And uh, just for those of you who may not be up to date with the new Uniform Civil Code that was passed, some of the new laws are um, banning polygamy, very obviously who it's aimed at, given that there are more Hindus who practice polygamy versus Muslims, but it's uh, not at least legalized in Hinduism. Uh, the minimum ages to marry has been raised for women to 18, for men to 21. It prohibits very interestingly, a person marrying relatives, including cousins, uncles, aunts, etc. Uh, equality in inheritance rights to sons and daughters tries to, uh, which is a very interesting thing, tries to control live-in relationships. People need to now inform authorities if they're in a uh, live-in relationship, otherwise they'll be fined and imprisoned. And of course, the tribal groups are not part of all of this. So these are some of the issues that have now created currently, as we are all talking here, debates in India, because they are uh, totally aimed at the politics and the elections that are coming up in a few months. Uh, another issue that I find problematic with the Uniform Civil Code is that while it may be a goal, the process has been very problematic. And there is need for change in each personal law, Hindu civil code in Muslim personal law, Christian, Parsi, Sikh. Within that, there is need to change for gender equality. 
And that should have been a recourse that the government should have taken. Because if we want to uh, assume, which we are not as a nation anymore, but would like to, that we are a secular nation with diversity and uh, et cetera, which is mentioned in the constitution at many times, is that the need to use culture and religion to bring about equality within each religion is a priority. The Uniform Civil Code will not challenge the position of women whose lives are controlled by culture and religion. We will still, still see the discriminations. We will still see the abuse. We will still see the uh, lack of status that is ascribed to women in all of these uh, religions where religion is being used through customary laws to oppress women. So for me, if we went to, to each religious group and their representatives and their uh, uh, legal experts and said, within your personal law, you should need to make some changes within your cultural context, that would have led to more emanci emancipation of Indian women than brutally assigning or forcing enforcing a law like the UCC just now, which is only going to create more hate, more divisions. And for Muslim women, since we're talking about them here, a bigger dilemma, because what does happen, and I do want to talk about briefly, uh, Sylvia, you talked about the BMMA, the Bharatiya Muslim Mahila thing and the All India Women, Muslim Women's Board, while they are speaking up, the BMMA is a BJP supported organization. So it's very problematic. And uh, the All India Muslim Women's Board is also very problematic because while they are speaking up, in contestation to the triple talaq, and not it's not the triple talaq which is really problematic. I'd like to do with it uh, myself. It is the criminalization part which is problematic and was uh, very unnecessary. Is that the All India Muslim Women's uh, Personal Law Board is strongly against gay rights. They are against uh, the children for free and compulsory education because they want to support madrasas and don't want them to really have too many options. They were also against the Child Marriage Restraint Act. So they are problematic groups, both of them, because one subscribes more to the Hindutva organization and the other to the more Islamic fundamentalist organizations. And I think what then ends up for most Muslim women is a contestation of their status, their lives, the discussion on their bodies by men and patriarchy within these organizations. And they, of course, women are part of patriarchy too, but this is uh, makes it very difficult for people like me to speak because I'm seen as a Muslim woman and therefore should be supporting certain things. And then sometimes I'm seen as a feminist and should be speaking against Islam and I don't want to do either of them. So on that note, and uh, with the very depressing situation today in India with the passing of the Uniform Civil Code in Uttarakhand, I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Azizuddin. Thank you, Dr. Uma. Thank you very much. It was really, you raised many questions now. I'm sure that in question session, there will be many questions. Uh, now this section will be moderated by Dr. Rafat Hussain. Before that, Next coming week's announcement is going to be on Pakistan, origins, identity, and future. And the speaker is a very, very well-known intellectual from the country, eminent physicist, public intellectual, Professor Parvez Hudbai, an international figure. So if stay tuned to that if you are interested on uh, knowing about the history and origins and all those things about Pakistan. Over to Dr. Rafat Hussain for moderating the question and session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raziuddin. So the question and answer session is open now. You can raise your digital hand or put your interest in the chat box. Thank you much.
And before we begin the question and answer session, I would like to thank all three speakers, especially Professor Wato and Dr. Alam and Professor Ghosh. Thank you very much for your input. Let's begin the uh, question and answer session. First person is the Sheikh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Please go ahead and mute yourself. One second, let me... I ask him to unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. He can do so now. Yeah. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, yes you. You, can, you can turn on the yeah. uh, video also. I did that. Uh, 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 thank you, Professor Vartuk, for such a wonderful lecture. And uh, I'm familiar with some of your work, uh, and uh, it has been... Uh, extremely useful for me to listen to to your analysis. Uh, my question, I have two quick questions, short questions, and then I have a comment. My question is, uh, uh, the book that I have read of yours, which is this Marriage and Discontent, which I'm holding in front of my head, uh, you know, most of your ethnographic work uh, is primarily in the Southern India. Uh, you know, Hyderabad, Madras, and all of that, a lot of the women organizations that you worked on. So there, there, there is this general argument that there is a difference between Southern Muslims and Northern Muslims. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, because you're also one of those who subscribe to the idea of Islamic feminism. And I was just wondering uh, whether there was anything that distinguishes Muslim women movement in the South, which is very different from Muslim women in the North. Uh, that's one question. The second question is this, that uh, after India becomes independent, uh, you know, uh, it's right few, few years after that, you have codification of uh, family laws in different countries, you know, Jordan, Morocco, to right. Pakistan, 1961, uh, inspired by, by Ottoman Empire's family laws of 1917. And... Uh, Personal Law Board comes in when it comes to existence uh, in 1973. Mm -hmm. So from 1947 to 1973, you know, uh, I was just wondering because we had a Prime Minister called Nehru who was quite vigilant and, and, and knowledgeable and was keeping track of things that's going on all over the world. And uh, why is it that there was no effort on the part of the Indian state to bring about any reform with respect to this amount of it? Uh, now, my comment uh, is uh, more on, on uh, Professor Humago's uh, remarks. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why Muslim society, and I, I would not like to make such a sweeping conclusion that why Muslims are so obsessed with the family laws, because my sense is this, that there are a lot of Muslim liberals who would have and who had uh, sown concerns and to, to address the gender equality question with respect to Muslims. Uh, Muslim women. Uh, take, for example, during the Lebanon debate, you have, uh, you know, Arif Muhammad Khan and others resigned uh, protesting it. You know, the, the unfortunate fact is that, that non Hindu governments or the so called secular governments largely offered patronage to Muslim conservatives and clergy. They did not stand by Muslim liberals. Had they stood by Muslim liberals, and there were plenty of them, probably the thing could have been different. That's one thing. The second thing I would, uh, uh, on the question of uniform civil code, uh, my comment would be, uh, which I have written, uh, uh, you know, we have a society where the majority religion largely governed by caste structures. There is no Hinduism without caste in India. And as we all know, caste stands for inequality. How could a society which is governed by inequality could aspire to have uniformity that this is a big question. So it's very important for us to pay attention to that when we talk about this high moral ground that majority religion or majoritarian project of India is, is trying to advance, uh, advance this particular thing. And the last comment is, I'm slightly concerned with your comment on Bama as a BJP organization, uh, because I have some familiarity with that organization, uh, the Varati Muslim Mahila Andalan. I'm aware that uh, Jackie Soman, who is one of their principal founders, wrote two letters, one in 2015 and another time in 2017, asking the government to intervene with respect to talak, uh, talak issues. 
all of it. Uh, but my sense is this, they were, they were founded and supported by left-wing organizations. One of the early supporters of that organization was Action Aid, which is not a BJP organization. In fact, BJP is hounding part of it. So I'm slightly concerned about that. So I'd be very happy if you can comment on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Too many questions, too many comments. Shall I respond? Yeah, yeah, please yeah go sure. Ahead. And then I, I am I am puzzled by your last I didn't say that that was a, a no, I said it. I said it. Oh, you said it. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> I was going to do I said that. Of course, I agree with what you said. Well, what you, you just said, the, the question. Um, uh, so you had a question about whether there's a difference or what the differences are between South Indian Muslims and North Indian. I, I, I really cannot speak to how it would have been different if I studied these matters in North India. For that, I could only refer to other scholars because I haven't done research among Muslims in North India, and certainly not, not in relation to the question of uh, divorce and, uh, and personal law. Uh, so I, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot written about the differences and certainly the idea that women in South India have, uh, you know, are more equal to men than they are in the North, uh, that the bias against uh, the gender bias is not as great in South India, that South Indian women in general uh, are more. Uh, have more agency, more independence, and so on. And I think there's quite a bit of evidence to that effect. I don't know that there is much written about whether this is true of Muslim, comparing Muslim women in the North and South. I, I don't think, at least I'm not aware of any, anyone who has you know, discussed this particular aspect. So I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, the, as far as the Uniform Civil Code is concerned, that is something that I chose not to get involved in in the talk because I wanted to be talking about, you know, I was asked to talk about Muslim personal law. Um, and when I said that, that there was nothing going, I don't know exactly what, how I put it, but when I suggested that not, that at, at the federal level, there was no active move at the moment going on. Of course, I could have mentioned the uh, Uttarakhand situation, um, but I was more of thinking about, you know, at the national level. Um, so I stand corrected by, by Huma on that point. And of course, I I've also feel very, um, uncertain about whether the best way to do this is to do it state by state. I don't think it is, uh, I, that doesn't seem. And even though these other states are considering it and maybe we'll pass similar laws, that may be the case. That presents a whole uh, set of other problems uh, that would need to be dealt with. But anyway, I, I didn't want to get into the a uniform civil code issue. I only mentioned it in passing. Um, now, was there another question that I from? I could pick up the questions Thank that you. Obama question. Just, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, firstly, with Nehru, you know, it doesn't sound as severe as today when the BJP is enforcing or you know pushing the UCC down the throats of all Indians, but Nehru's. Um, also rejection or refusal to confront the UCC when it was being brought up. And it wasn't just Nehru, by the way, it was Shastri and everybody else, except Ambedkar, who did not really want the UCC to happen uh, in the 1950s, early 1950s, because India had just been partitioned and Nehru did say it in as many words 
that he was aiming towards unity and not creating mm -hmm. more friction and he did not want the Muslims to feel insecure. So mm -hmm. frankly, he did politicize it at that time too. And I mean, and that's uh, a very different discussion, but it was only Ambedkar who was really, really pushing for it. But other Hindu leaders in the Constitutional Assembly also did not want to talk about UCC because they wanted the Hindu rights and the, everything else, whatever goes with it. So that uh, to me was, so while we did live in a secular India, which I really, really appreciate it because I've done a lot of research in the last, last five years, and that's where I'll come back to the BMMA also, is that I thought uh, when I was interviewing, I was there on a Fulbright in uh, 2019, I thought I was in another country when I was interviewing the young Muslim and Hindu women in uh, Jamia University, Delhi University, and Jawaharlal Nehru University, the changes that have occurred based on hate, etc. since 2013 are very, very apparent and part of everything that's going on today. So yes, we are both seculars and to be a true secularist in India is a Muslim secularist uh, because I have not met many Hindu secularists except a handful. Um, also, caste definitely is a very, very uh, big issue and that is the whole irony of a united Hindu nation and Hindutva because they can't get the caste sorted out. So how can they unite? But it will not be an issue because, and this is where I talk more in terms of dilemmas. How much control do we have? Us speakers, you, the audience, or anybody on what uh, Modi is trying to do. And this state by state UCC will happen and the only places I think talking, coming back to your north-south question from my own research five years ago, is that the southern states may have the courage to not bring it forward. Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and maybe Telangana. But in North India, Gujarat, and I don't know about Bengal and Orissa, and I would be very, very curious to see what happens there. Uh, they may delay it because of the elections. Definitely the UCC uh, will pass. So if uh, one really has to see the situation of Muslim women and Muslims in India state by state, there is a distinction. And I think the UCC may test that. I mean, this is just my guess and hypothesis. And yeah, concerned about B BMMA, you're right. It started definitely, definitely under very secular and a little left. And um, I want to say that uh, also very protective of the Islamic family laws. I will not deny they were not, they did engage in discussions and engagements and they are definitely theoretically in the realm of Islamic uh, feminists. Um, and use that for analysis. But last four years ago, when I was there five years ago and interviewed some of them, I did get the sense that since their beginnings, they are not going far enough to be seen as contesting BJP agendas. And they are aligned on many issues with uh, BJP Hindu women. And when it came to certain temple issues, they did not speak up. So I, maybe it comes across like I'm exaggerating that they are aligned. They're not aligned with BJP, maybe not, but definitely they are a body that the BJP seeks out to when wanting to deal with Muslims. And, I, and that's where, that. in my mind, it's losing some of its legitimacy. Okay, thank you for concluding it. Uh, the next, because there are so many questions lined up. Okay, D uh, Dr. Sayyid Amir, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I, it was... Um, very learning experience, and I want to thank the all three speakers. This question is uh, primarily uh, addressed to Dr. Vatnak, and Dr. Bush also can uh, answer. I'm curious what happens in situations where in India, where the marriage is uh, 
between a Muslim man and a non-Muslim woman. Um, and non-Muslim woman is not obviously bound by Sharia or um, the injunctions of the uh, various uh, laws. Um, how would it be decided? Um, would they still have to uh, go through the same process or different process? The second question is, um, or little comment is that um, some of the problems maybe now in present day India may have arisen because of the hostility of the present government and trend. If you, um, and I'm diversing a little bit, diverging a little bit, the provisions in the uh, new um, uh, state laws um, seem to be on the face of friendly to the, the women, the Muslim women, and uh, there doesn't seem there should be any reason for a great deal of opposition to it. Uh, it seems the trend in general moving in that direction, Islamic, some of the Islamic countries also have, including Pakistan, have amended the laws more favorable to the women. And we live here in the West, in America, in Canada, or whatever. And we very, very uh, willingly accept all the provisions of the, of the what is there is they're trying to do in India. So if there was not less unfriendly environment, do you think Muslim women would be more accepting to it? Or if there was not as much a um, question of the poverty of Muslim women or deprivation, economic deprivation of the Muslim women, it would become more palatable? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Professor Watok, please be brief because there are other questions lined up, please. Oh, okay. Go ahead, please. You want me to go ahead? Oh, I yeah, thought, that is, that I is thought you said I should wait for the other question. Sorry. No, no, I oh. said uh, please be brief. Oh, I'll be brief. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> the mixed marriage situation. Um, this is something, of course, that has become a big issue in Indian politics uh, because uh, in Islam, strictly <laughs> interpreted, um, if a man uh, marries a not a woman not of the book, in other words, if he marries a Christian, okay, because that's the Bible and so on. But if he marries a Hindu woman, she has to be converted to uh, Islam before they get married. And so this has become a big issue. Now, as far as the, in, as far as Indian law is concerned, that couple can marry without conversion under the uh, Special Marriage <laughs> Act. And, and couples who are aware of this, usually educated elite uh, couples, that's what they do. They simply marry under the Special Marriage Act, no problem. But those, um, if it's a Muslim family who may not even know about the Special Marriage Act or don't want to, their, their son to do it that way or the son himself doesn't want to do it that way, then the question arises that she must convert. And so, but this has been big, this whole, you know, rhetoric about love jihad and Muslims <laughs> going around looking for Hindu women to forcefully convert them and marry them. And, you know, so that they'll have more Muslim children born. So the population will change from Hindu majority to Muslim. I mean, it's a whole lot of rubbish, but I does that answer your question at all? Um, uh, yeah, but I don't want to go on about it. But I was also wondering how the divorce situation will our laws will apply in this case. Well, I'll, I'll speak to that being part okay, of uh, thank of, you. Of being part of love jihad. Forty years later, I'm told I'm part of love jihad, being a Muslim <laughs> woman married to a Hindu man. Absolutely. I love it. Have a so because I can be a jihadi and I can have love, then nothing can be better. <laughs> So well, as far as divorce is concerned, <laughs> if they have married under the under Civil, the yeah. marriage act, then divorce is as is applied under that act. If they are married 
if they are married in a Muslim marriage, they must go uh, for a divorce under the Muslim law. And the man can divorce her as he would divorce a Muslim, originally a Muslim wife. If she wants to get a divorce, she goes to court and files under the Special Marriage Act. And in fact, in my research, limited though it is a sample, quite a few of them were mixed marriages in which it was the non originally non-Muslim wife who was filing. She can file under that act because she's a Muslim, but in fact, she was originally a Hindu uh, in those cases. So that, yeah. And now the, there was also, yeah. there was also a question in the chat that I wanted to respond. Someone asked about Shia. Any yeah, thank you. I was coming to that question. Please um, go. Ahead. So uh, yes, uh, Shia will not uh, go with uh, Chival Talar. The Shia insist that be done in this gradual, in the approved gradual manner. So I think that may answer the question. I, I interviewed people, Shia also, and they confirmed that they would not uh, tolerate that. Yeah. They don't consider that a valid divorce. And the last question from the last, I wasn't very clear on what the question, on the question exactly what you were getting at. Maybe I can pick that up. But you know, for your questions are great. Special Marriage Act is widely, widely used in India for interreligious, intercaste. Mm -hmm. Also, by the way, intercaste can be as uh, you know troubling oh, marriages. Yeah. And so, once you're in the, you're registered under the Special Marriage Act. All your family laws, custody, divorce, everything is. Uh, governed by that yeah, yeah, and yeah. yes you are very right I think the main point and that is what is going to show up now is the hostile government if the government was not so focused on creating a Hindu state and Hindutva etc uh, some of these issues could have been um, discussed I don't want to say resolved in very different ways but because it is so politicized it's creating the backlash that it is. But also I do want to bring up a point that there's a lot of writing coming out from India where uh, there are certain groups in India where Islamic fundamentalism is on the rise. And we cannot um, uh, deny that. And where women are willing participants to Muslim women are. And this is again coming back to my original point how women are, Muslim women are going to get caught between two fundamentalist uh, uh, you know, perspectives, and will have be forced to take sides, which may not benefit them ultimately. So I call it Saudi Islam versus, you know, we had a very, very diverse uh, Islamic cultures in India, and I'm seeing them get pushed towards a very similar fundamentalist kind of Islam, which is coming from outside, yeah. Thank you, Professor Goch. Let's move on to the people who have raised hand. Uh, Saeed Zadi, Dr. Saeed Zadi, please. Yeah, so uh, at the comment and maybe question too, um, as somebody just mentioned in Shia, um, you cannot do three times say talaq either in anger or excitement or whatever and talaq become materialized. So in Shia fiqh, you have to do in three different settings with two witnesses. That's one important thing. Second thing, talaq doesn't happen just by saying one person. It has to be, when you do nekha, you have a whole sikha, some, either yourself or somebody, you know, recites that and then both agrees with witness. So that's another thing. So it should be a little bit more burdensome for, for a man, actually, uh, to go through this process. Second, third thing is the ishtihad, modification, which, of course, in Sunni fiqh has been abandoned um, some long time ago. Uh, but ishtihad and modification is the key to this this problem, both in India and elsewhere. Thank you. Okay. Um, any comment? Uh, I, I don't think so. Let's move on to the Nazma Parveen. 
Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Water. It, that was a wonderful session and very informative, and I have learned a lot from your work as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I have recently done some uh, research, uh, a field work on the, the implementation of this particular tri triple talaq law. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I have a comment to make, and uh, I also have a question. So first of all, you know, I think what I feel about the UCC and uh, the whole debate on the, the triple talaq law and things like that, that that is happening in India. I think the whole issue of uh, uh, women's right or Muslim women's right, it has been, uh, you know, trapped into this secular versus communal binary. And uh, from the very beginning, at, as Professor Huna, Huma also, uh, you know, mentioned this aspect that how Nehru also, uh, you know, kind of uh, politicized this uh, this whole issue of UCC. So the whole issue of UCC has been put forward to us or has been projected as something which is going to be which is which is essentially anti-Muslim or anti-Muslim personal law personal laws. So this is something. This is a narrative which has been created. This is a narrative which has been established for last 30, 70, 75 years, and it has been well taken by uh, you, you know the by the political elite, by the the people, activists, and everybody who is working, um, uh, you know, who is uh, uh, against UCC or in support of UCC or you know this this kind of this binary has always been there, and I feel that Indian uh, you know the Indian feminist movement. With due respect to the the struggle, the 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 debates that they they have taken forward, and the issues they have uh, fought for, uh, uh, women's issues they have fought for, but uh, you know the Indian feminist movement has also been trapped into this particular uh, dilemma uh, that if we support, uh, you know, the question, Miss Parveen, please. Yes, I'm I'm going I'm going to ask that question now. Uh, so in that case, you know, and there is always this kind of situation that there should be internal reform. Now, this whole idea of internal reform is highly problematic. And this is a question to Professor Watuk as well, that uh, since you have worked with the Sharia courts, you have uh, closely worked, you close, closely observed these courts, and you have seen the procedures there. How do you feel? How do? Uh, what is your stand on uh, the internal reforms? Uh, how would you take it? Well, I I guess I would I would say it is a very uh, if it is happen if it happens at all it will be a very long long uh, procedure because um, first of all who is going to reform it there are certainly reformist Muslim organizations yes. Yes. but mm -hmm. their numbers are very small in comparison to the other side of mm -hmm. things those who want it to be kept as it is and who believe that it is God-given and cannot be changed. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I mean, it's a, external reform is also <laughs> going to be a long thing. So I, I guess I don't have a whole lot of hope of either from inside or outside of much. It will be a very gradual thing if, at all. That's my, yes, I yes. guess I'm a born pessimist. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. I just would like to uh, add one more point, you know, because I have done this some uh, research. So I found that all the claims that were made that uh, the law is made to put all the Muslim men behind bars and it's going to end, uh, uh, it's a strategy to end Muslim civilization. And nothing, nothing like that has happened. No, no one has uh, gone to jail, and the Nobody police is, is working the way. All the institutions and are working the way they are. Uh, they have been working with their patriarchal approach. So uh, you know, and the burden of proof is still on women to prove that uh, the this kind of incident has taken place. So uh, thank you very much for that. For your response. Thank you, thank you so much. And there is a one question in chat from uh, Noshad Ali, sir. Uh, Rafat, Dr. Jabbar, is raised hand. Okay, so uh, yeah. from Noshad Ali, sir, when, if the CA and UCC is passed, how to neutralize uh, the deep impact, especially on Muslim women? So maybe Dr. Goj will take that question? Or... Uh yeah, I can. By the way, my name, last name is Ahmed Ghosh. It's hyphenated. Yeah, just, I'm sorry. Just, I, just, I, just to make sure that now in this India, my, my I am identified better. I would have pushed it so hard earlier. Thank uh, you. you know, my, 
Uh, that... There is a helplessness. I do want to say there is a helplessness for Muslims. And by the way, other minorities, we don't talk about them because they're not the flavor of the season. But Christians are getting uh, uh, having a very, very hard time. And also just a little with the UCC, I do want to see what they're going to do with the Sikhs because just now they are not in the yes. same uh, okay. category either. So, but, uh, you know, I don't know is my answer because we will have to follow laws that the Supreme Court does pass and the constitution will get changed and there will be parliamentary changes, et cetera. I think for me, it is the perfect time for the more traditional, and I really mean conservative, uh, Indian Muslim organizations to look with him to see how they can reclaim their legitimacy by uh, re-traditionalizing is a word I'd like to use, some of the stuff without um, being the, the ones who are protesting constantly because I don't think the more conservative voices will have a place in India anymore. And uh, the UCC, as far as I'm concerned, is not a bad thing. The way it happened is problematic. And as things go on, and Modi will be there for some time, unfortunately, the Congress has, doesn't have its act together. Muslims in India need to regroup. This is the time to regroup and see where, what is Islam, what is culture, what is secularism, and keep their, uh, you know, a presence in the game by being more participatory along secular lines than being defensive of what their perspective of Islam is. And Nehru made the first mistake by going with uh, the religious uh, leaders in Mus uh, among Muslims to answer that very brilliant question. There were many, many secular Muslims. Nehru didn't take them into account. BJP themselves will also be very strategic about which Muslims they will take into account when changing laws. But till then, we have to just sit and wait and be patient and hope that Muslim organizations can look within themselves and try to create an environment for Muslims and other minorities. For me, it's very, very important at this time for Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Christians, others to come together and Dalits and Dalits and Dalits to come together because the main crisis in India is caste. It is not Muslims, it is the caste system. All Muslims can leave the country, but the Dalits will still be Dalits in India. Thank you. <clears throat> so Dr. Alam, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I, we are I over just had a, thank you for that. this uh, very insightful discussion. I just had a comment uh, a, about um, internal reform, and B, um, this is more, the, the second one is more of a comment and a question. Um, I think there has been a lot of uh, discussion uh, about uh, reform, about uh, changing Islam, about presenting liberal interpretations of Islam. At this point of time, it's a very extensive tradition. Um, the problem is that that has not been able to challenge orthodoxy. Uh, mm -hmm. They have remained marginalized. So uh, we can push for reform, but eventually the power structures tend to support certain kinds of interpretation only. And this is also the problem that Islamic feminism eventually has to grapple. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is that um, you know, as a scholar of women's history, I also, it's my dream that there would be a law that promises gender equality to Muslim women. Um, but for me, what is happening right now, I haven't seen the draft of the UCC code that was passed in Uttarakhand, but uh, Dr. Ahmed Ghosh, among the points that you mentioned, an immediate red flag was that you are supposed to report to the authorities if you are in living relationship. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously yeah. a state that is creating a new patriarchy. Yeah. So, um, so what is going to, um, you know, one has to see what the nature of the state is and then, yeah. uh, you know, be very vigilant. I mean, there mm -hmm. might be some things that are promising, but I was aghast that, you know, why should somebody go and report to the authorities if they are living with somebody? But, oh, you know, you. it seems that something else is also happening. Yeah. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Good Dr. Point. Alim. Thank you for touching on the orthodoxy versus the modernism. 
Hmm. So and uh, there is all, uh, we are already over time. So let's ask the last question from Abdul Jabbar sir. Please be brief, and then I hand over to Doctor. Uh, yeah, I mean I think uh, it's a great discussion uh, about a very complex uh, topic. Uh, as I got some clarification. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, South and North divide, uh, also there could be social economic divide among Muslims in India. So I think uh, 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 how does it, it your, uh, the, your research projects that kind of uh, division in, in analyzing uh, the marriages, divorces? Thank you. Uh, in terms of my, my research in the courts, I was I was looking for exactly that as at least as far as the socioeconomic uh, ranking of the people who came into the court. And what I found was that probably the majority of those who are in court for the um, this is in, in terms of the divorce, uh, Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act, they tend to be more upper middle class, educated people. Um, in the other, in the courts where they were discussing uh, maintenance issues, this was in the magistrate's court, there you don't find very many from the upper classes, but more the middle, you also don't find many of the very poor because mainly I think because of the expense, because they often have children and they're not free to come to court at any time, many reasons, but they are not the poorest of the poor who come in for, for asking for maintenance. Also, they have to be women whose husbands have a job, who have some money that they're able to support them. So again, this doesn't count the very poor. Uh, so, um, but as far as the, the divorce cases, which is mainly what I was talking about here, uh, they do tend to be, you know, to women who are, you know, knowledgeable, who are, who have the money that they need to, you know, enough to, to cover the expense and the knowledge and the ability to have a good lawyer and all like that. So they do tend to be, the few cases that there are tend to be uh, suits by women of some some means. Uh, Thank you. So that, that concludes the question and answer session. And I would again like to thank Professor Vartok and Dr. Asi Alam, and of course, Professor Ahmed Ghosh. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful session. And of course, it generated a lot of questions, as you see. And now I hand over back to Dr. Rasyukti for a final comment. And thank you. thank you, Rapat. No, I think we had uh, enough questions, enough uh, discussion. It's quite late also for at least the Indian audience. Uh, but it really generates a lot of uh, further questions. And there was one very thoughtful from Mujib, I think from Jamia, uh, or someone else said that had it been, like if it had been coming from a communist government or from a centrist government, a left government or a centrist government, mm -hmm. suppose in Kerala, the present government. Uh, so not many Muslims would have objected to it because it is overdue. The new generation Muslims, really, they want a uniform civil court. But since it is coming, or many such things are coming from BJP, that also becomes a counter argument. Look, in the 80s, the left-oriented CPI um, associated women's feminist movement they backed off because BJP took this agenda and they said that they hijacked it and so we don't want to be associated. So the cause, of the, I mean, the whole uh, movement for them, the reason was BJP, not the real issue. So we are trapped into this, that it sounds very good. The 
UCC in Uttarakhand sounds very good, but it is coming from them. And since next day, next day a mosque is demolished or a Muslim man was killed, so people think about automatically that is this a part of agenda or they are is they are just rubbing the salt on the wound or that kind of thing. But actually, this is what it is, unfortunately. Anyway, thank you very much. It is can be a long discussion. Maybe we can re-invite you speakers again. Thank you very much, especially Professor. Thank you. So I, I Razi, by sorry, I, I just want to draw attention of Aisha yeah, yeah. uh, comments. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. please uh, read them. I wish uh, we could have addressed them. But uh, anyway, the time is over. And thank you so no, much. No, for... Just read, read. This is the professor from Aligarh, uh, English department, Aisha. Uh, read, uh, Rafat, if you have. Okay, let's see. Aisha Munir. She has a lot of comments. No, the, the, the first part only. Okay. For... And others, yeah. Okay. One important question to the Muslim community. Are we ready to take a moment on introspection and think of internal reform? Use this tehad and evolve. Sharia shouldn't be the frozen in time. Sure. So, and uh, the last one is in the reconstruction of the religious thought in Islam. Iqbal endorses equal legal rights for men and women in Islam. Yeah. So those uh, two comments uh, and the others is the appreciation. Yeah. So. Thank Let's leave it. <laughs> yeah, there, there I, is a, I, I I wonder what happened, what Iqbal himself did with the first first marriage. Whether he really I know. Uh, with he really did good equality clause he applied because all his passions and all his uh, uh, associations seem to be with the, with the second marriage and the first wife was almost neglected. Even the son was neglected. So anyway, but he was talking equal, not equal benefits. He was talking <laughs> equal responsibility. <laughs> well, that that is part of the equal benefit, also. Yeah, is equal, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. He was not even. So, Rajiva, if Abed Manzil was with the second, Rajibai, yeah. If marriage is not working, and then she is neglected or he is neglected, you cannot blame uh, the religion. Well, you cannot blame anything else. Well, the marriage is not. Time, at that time, half of the marriages were. Actually, men thought they were more educated, so they took another wife, thinking that this wife is not up to their standard. Really, a lot in 60s and 50s and 40s happened in Aligarh. I am, I know, you know, many of those names yeah. that they were just traditional marriages from a very good family, but the yeah. woman, because women were not given uh, in the schools and colleges, they didn't go. So, this good ladies keeps on serving and the husband comes back from Cambridge or even from Delhi. And though it says that, uh, no, she is not. I want an, to marry another one. Yeah. And, yeah, it happened. They were not compatible. It happened. Happen. Sorry. You know, I think our, our discussion is going off track to very personal oh. kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, it happened uh, even in 1910. Sorry, this will not be part of the YouTube. Yeah. This will be edited. Yeah. So this, our okay, let, let, let me stop uh, the recording. <laughs> well, even if you have recorded, Faisal will cut it out. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.